Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. I think I've met some of you. I'm Bob Raycook, the senior librarian here. We'll get started in just a minute, but I want to take this opportunity to remind you that tonight's program is funded by donations. So please consider making a gift to the Ranch Mirage Library and Observatory. The envelopes are on the table by the exit. We've got a great program for you tonight, and here to get us started is Frank Farino. Please have a great evening. Thank you, Bob. Good evening. Nice to see you here. We do have a great evening because we have with us one of the great directors uh, in television and film. And um, I never had the opportunity to work with him, but I did have the opportunity to see his stuff. And once you've seen his stuff, you know how good Jerry London is. We're here tonight to talk about his book, from I Love Lucy to Shogun and Beyond, Tales from the Other Side of the Camera. I think when they first, per, <clears throat> excuse me, when they first publicized the book here, they had half the title. It said Tales from the Other Side. And people were a little confused as to what this evening was going to be. But it's going to be an evening dedicated to an industry that we all grew up on and, and has changed exponentially since. But there are some stories in here, and, and I, I urge you to get a copy of this because here's mine. And as you can see, I went through and I made <laughs> a couple of notes. But I, I want to just read to you, and by the way, uh, with Jerry, his co-writer Rhonda Collier is also here. You will meet her this evening. That's why there are two chairs. I am not going up there. Um, but I want to just read to you the, the pr one line from the first page of the preface of this book. And I think it will do a great deal to tell you what you'll read and discover within the book. And I quote, how did the scrawny kid standing in the middle of the tennis courts at Alhambra High School end up standing in the middle of the Roman Colosseum with Gregory Peck and Christopher Plummer? How did he go from looking through the lens of an old 35 millimeter camera to looking out the window of Gina Lola Brigida's bedroom? <laughs> Tells you all you need to know. But there are so many great little pieces in here. Uh, and you know, for me, um, it, and it, it, you know, things will, will touch you, some things touched me. Uh, I haven't even had a chance to talk to Jerry about it. I was a big David Jansen fan. And there's a great piece in here about David Jansen. And David Jansen, as some of you may know, uh, sadly had a $7 million estate in Palm Springs and never lived long enough to move into it, uh, which was really, really sad. Um, there's a great piece in here about Patty Duke, whom I absolutely loved. Uh, it, it goes on and on. I won't, I won't bore you because you, you, can, you can find out for yourself. Um, Nice piece in here about your uh, involvement, I should say involvement, it sounds, with Faye Dunaway. Ooh. In any case, um, I'm going to bring the two up here, Jerry London, Rhonda Collier, and have them talk to you specifically and personally about this book, and you guys can ask any questions you would like. Thank you. <laughs> And I'll come to you and you can ask with a microphone that you can be heard with. Okay, guys? Well, first of all, thank you for all for coming. Uh, the uh, wonderful thing that happened when my daughter wrote a book on casting. She's a casting director. And uh, I never knew she could write. And she wrote this great book and... She had so much fun and got so much out of the feedback from her book. Um, she kept saying to me and when we had dinners or lunch, you got so many stories to tell. You can't lose them. You have to write a book. And I said, I'm not a writer. I, can, I don't know how to write a book. I can tell the stories. And so she said, well, you need to get a co-writer. And Rhonda overheard this. And she says, I'll do it. And because of Rhonda, the whole 
issue of the book came together. And um, the feedback is what's great. I love feedback. Ask all the questions you want. I'll be pretty honest on the answers. <laughs> and uh, take it away. I'll try to get him to tell some of the stories he wouldn't let me write about. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> There's some pretty good parts in there. How many people, I'm just curious, have already read the book? Okay, good. So you guys might have a few questions. But there are a lot of people, a lot of adventures, and a lot of things that Jerry went through. And as, as I recall it, right, the dress was blue, we were sitting at dinner, and he was one more story, one more story. And I, too, said the same thing. Jer, you got to get this stuff down, you know, because it's just story after story. And he said, I know. Lisa says I should write a book. I said, well, why don't you help me with it? And I said, OK. And we were off to the races. I think it was important for me as a writer to sort of not just have a series of cocktail stories, but to string it together so we were following a character. So we did start out with that scrawny little kid standing in the tennis court as a teenager wondering what he was going to do. He passed up a scholarship to Yale, for those of you guys who haven't read the book yet. And to have ended up where he ended up, I wanted the reader to have a sense of following a character, if you will, and his journey to find out, well, what happened to him next? As well as, well, Faye Dunaway and Burt Reynolds and a few other people that we'll get to tonight. But we're happy to answer questions, or I can just poke at him to tell some stories. Poke, okay. <laughs> All right, Jerry, let's just go right for the jugular. Who did you find the most, I'm gonna ask double question, who did you find the most, the easiest person to work with, and who did you find the most difficult person to work with? Well, it's not one person, <laughs> but, but uh, the easiest person, persons to deal with are the big stars. The bigger they are, the easier they are to work with. The Charlton Heston, Gregory Peck, uh, those kind of names, those Oscar winners, in fact, I've worked with 25 Oscar winners and they have the confidence in themselves and the confidence in, in the director. So it makes it very easy to direct them. One of the keys that a director does when he first meets an actor that he hasn't met before is to gain, try to gain their confidence. Because once you gain their confidence, that's what makes it easy. And it's hard enough making films because of all the technical issues you have you don't want to have problems with your actors. So I would just say the bigger they are, the easier they are. The tough ones are the younger actors that get to in a series really quick, and uh, they get their nose in the air, they get arrogant, and uh, they're disrespectful. But I'm a chess player, so when I, when I talk to them, I can sense it right away, and I start moving the pieces around, and hopefully, at the end of the first day of filming or whatever, I've got them. And most of the time, I do. Every once in a while, you run into a bad egg that is a drinker or is on uh, substance. And that's a hard part because no matter what psychology you use, it doesn't, it, you can't get to them. That's the hard part of it. In fact, in the book, I tell quite a few stories about uh, uh, people that are on the substance, and uh, a lot of it is very humorous. Like, um, I work with an actor by the name of Ray Sharkey. I don't know if anybody knows who he is, but he died mm -hmm. from substance abuse. But uh, he was playing a quadriplegic in this television movie. And the name so, of the film was? I don't remember. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, something about Bill Carney. The ordeal yeah. of Bill Carney, that was it. Um, I, he knew, he had a reputation, but I met with him and, you know, I said, look, I know all about your stuff, but, uh, you know, I don't deal with that. He says, I'm clean, I'm clean. And I had my doubts, but the first couple of days was okay. And then I was driving to work and I was going from L.A. to San Pedro at six in the morning. And uh, I'm listening to the news and it says, actor Ray Sharkey was arrested last night for attacking his wife with a knife. And I'm going to the set to film with him. <laughs> now, that's quite a jolt, right? And so I get to the set, and I said, uh, the, the director has to you know, figure out everything. He makes all the decisions. I said, guys, no matter what you were planning, 
we're changing everything. And I had to change the whole schedule and work with the actors that I had. I didn't even know if he would come back. Anyway, his agent and the, the network and everybody, they, they got a hold of him. He came back about 1 o'clock, and uh, they said, your career's over if you do it again. And he swore, I know it was bad. I, I was a high and everything else. And uh, I got through it with him. But the, the other funny thing that happened, I was doing a scene where he had a, a long monologue, and he was sitting in this chair, and he started to talk, and he started to talk, and I moved the camera in, and I kept moving it in, and it lasted about a minute and a half. By the time I, the camera got into his close-up, he was fast asleep. <laughs> he fell asleep while I was filming. <clears throat> yeah. What can you do, you know? Anyway, I, I get through the... the the picture, I fixed his, all his performances with the editing, and it looked pretty good. And when the, when the uh, Golden Globe Awards came out, he was nominated as Best Actor. <laughs> 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 it's a crazy business. It really is. Should have given it to the editor. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Testing. Uh, you work with two of my favorite actors, and my recollection is that they sat at opposite ends of the spectrum, and I'd like to ask you. One, uh, the, the interesting Robert Blake. Right. The other, it, Lloyd Bridges. Right. Can you talk about those yeah. two? Let me talk about Lloyd Bridges, one of the great guys in the business. You'd, you'd love to work with him. He was friendly. He was happy. He was just a wonderful guy. And uh, he, he got hurt well, I was filming his shows. I forgot the name of it. I can't. Remember. Joe Forrester was the name of it, and he and he and he got hurt while we were filming. I forgot if he sprained an ankle or he did something, and uh, he had to leave. And I had all this day's work, you know, to to do. So I got his double, and I shot all the scenes with the other actors over the doubles back, to uh, to at least get the work done. And then when he came back a couple of days later. We just did all these close-ups, and he was so accommodating, you know, it was never a problem. And I'm sure his sons are like that, too. I think Jeff Bridges has got a great reputation and um, a great person. And uh, as far as Bobby Blake, Robert Blake, uh, he's, he's quite a character. I don't know if he killed his wife or not, I don't know. But uh, I had this part in this uh, miniseries I did which was called Chiefs. And it was a great part for a psychotic po po police cop. And uh, it was a hard part to cast. I had cast the whole other movie except for that one role. And uh, so I met with Blake and I, I talked to him and, uh, and you know, it was okay. And I, I just could never pull the string about using him. And, uh, but, uh, and then when I did his show, Beretta, he was a madman then because he was the lead. And he would take the day's work and rewrite everything and then give it to the script supervisor and said, this is what we're shooting. Of course, we had already cast the scenes we were doing and none of it made any sense anymore. But he had this control thing and he, and he, and he made us go over budget and the things didn't work. Eventually, they canceled the series because of who he was, you know? So it takes all kinds. I think he's playing golf with O.J. I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, I work with O.J. Yeah, he was, at that point, he was, wasn't a very good actor, but he was a, some kind of presence, you know? Well, as I said, the directors were... Oh, I'm sorry. She's asking about props and costumes, things other than directing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, props, costumes, makeup. The director has responsible, is responsible for everything. Um, the producer in the, in the studio helps get a list of people, and then we interview them and hire the people that we think are right. And, uh, but, you know, I'm the last person that looks through the lens and sees what somebody looks like. So if the costume is off, I've got to tell them. If the makeup isn't right, I gotta tell him. And of course, the director of photography is also my eyes and, and my camera operator. And the three of us uh, are responsible for getting it right. 
but it isn't like, um, you know, we hire uh, someone, they pick the dress they like, and they come out and do it. It doesn't work that way. We, we have a, um, a show and tell on all the costumes. You know, they look at them either on the actor or actress, or um, see them on the rack, but everything is checked. Yes? Yeah. Stories about Lucille Ball. Lucy and Lucy and Desi. Well, I started on I Love Lucy. I, I was an apprentice film editor. And the first day I went to work uh, was in uh, a long time ago. <laughs> uh, I walked up the stairs in, uh, uh, at the studio. It was on uh, Cahuenga in Hollywood. And um, I was going to meet the editor. And I walk up there. And I walk into the cutting room. And in those days... They didn't have digital. You actually cut the film with the machine. And he was standing there putting the, the film in the machine in his underwear. And that was my first day on the job. I said, what am I getting into? Well, that day was 110 degrees. It was in September. And that's why he had his underwear on. But it was kind of a shock when you walk in. <laughs> but, um, uh, but what we would do is on the weekends, we would take the prior week's show that was edited and we'd take it for, to Desi's at his house. He had three houses, one in Beverly Hills, one in Del Mar when the racing season was on, and one in Palm Springs. He had a house at Thunderbird. And uh, so every Saturday we'd go out and uh, Desi was a great guy. He was very personable. He talked to anybody. Lucy was more aloof. She was uh, great at working on the scripts and finding the comedy elements. But she wasn't as social as Desi was. But, um, you know, I met the kids and everything. And, uh, it, but I must say, Desi was a genius. You know, he put together this whole multi-camera thing that they have. that started then on Lucy. He had three cameras. Nobody had ever done that before. And, uh, but I can't say enough about Desi. He was wonderful. Um, one day we were in Del Mar, and we were uh, running the film, and the door popped open, and we were in his garage, and uh, Johnny Longdon, the jockey, came in, and he says, Desi, uh, today's the day, Des. I said, what? I'm, I'm bringing your horse in. It's going to win. We're going to win. He said, really? Okay, boys, pack it up. We're going to the track, Desi says. So we all get in the, the convertible, and... Uh, Desi's friend, the actor Fernando Lamas, went with us. And we went, and we, I was 18 years old. And uh, we go into the, um, the, the high-end area of the, of the racetrack and had a beautiful lunch and all the women with their hats. And it was really deluxe, right? Anyway, the races go off. So goes, and about the sixth race, this is Desi's race. And so I run over and I take five bucks and I put it on the wind window. Well, five bucks for an 18-year-old kid at that time, that was big stuff, right? And the race goes off and the horse is going and Desi's yelling, he's cussing, he says, go your mother. And he was cussing like a, a blue streak, and really loud, you know. And the race is over and it wins, the horse wins. So we're all yelling and jumping. And then the inquiry sign came in. They said that the horse bumped another horse. Well not only in Spanish, but in heavy English. I'd never heard such language, ever. And you know, and I'm going, I'm, going, I'm like this, I'm dying, right? And he's screaming and yelling, and, and then they check the tape or whatever, and Desi's horse did win. Ray, yay. So now we're driving back to Del Mar, and um, Fernando, Fernando's in the front seat next to Desi, and he says, uh, does uh, turn on the radio, I want to hear the last race. And he says, uh, why, you got something going? And he says, yeah, there's some long shot. I put a few bucks on it. It's no, no chance, right? So you turn it on, and you hear the race, and you hear the race. And the long shot comes in and paid 50 to 1. And, and Desi started again, but this time on Fernando. <laughs> it was great. It was great stuff. Anybody else a question? Yes, in the back. You know what happened was um, there was a radio show called My Favorite Husband. And Lucy was the star of that with uh, an actor by the name of Richard Denning. 
And it was basically, I love Lucy without Desi, is what it was. So when the, the writer uh, saw that the television in, in those days was just coming up, he wrote the script for I Love Lucy, and they talked to him, and that's how it came together. But uh, the comedy was built by the writers. They had the greatest writers, writing staff, and they would work on all these intricate comedy bits, and uh, Lucy made them happen. They were on paper, but Lucy figured out a way to make all those interesting things happen. She was a great comedian, but she didn't realize it, you know, and, but she's, she was great. I've read some um, of her biographies on her, and she did come from New York with, you know, stars in her eyes to be a serious actress. I don't think anyone ever sets out to, you know, shove chocolates in their face, particularly in that time. Everyone viewed themselves as a serious actor, and they fall into comedy. But she just had such a natural gift for it that that's, that was just her, her calling. But. Yes. And I never saw it. I never saw it. Um, in the early years, I think there was no problem. I think it happened later, you know, when, when the shows started to fade. You know, they went from the half-hour concept to hours. They made a, quite a few hour shows. And uh, uh, I think that, but I never saw anything. I never did. Yes? Well, uh, I'll answer the second part first. Uh, yeah, you know what? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to. Yeah. I, yeah I will roam around. Yeah, and, and, let, uh, him, let him say yeah, it again. Just go ahead. I got it. You got it? All right. uh, the first part was, if I can remember it, um, uh, he, he, said, he said that as a director, he would be watching what was going on, and they, they had to get it right. And I was asking about... Is the right what he wanted, or is it that it's pure? It's it's the right thing he wants to see. And the second thing is, why would you pick a big actor like Peck, for example? Is it the the street cred he brings, or is there something about his ability that he wants to have in the film? Well, uh, when you say getting it right, when I look through getting it right, it is there's no right or wrong. It, does the material work? That's that's the answer. I've read the script. I know the script upside down, backwards. And it either happens or it doesn't happen. And that's my ears and eyes. It's a feeling. It's instinct. It, but, but there's no right or wrong. I might, I might know what the material is. And the actor can bring so much more to it, which is great when they do it. And if they're lacking in something, I will tell them to put more energy in it or it doesn't work. And that's how we get the direction right. As far as the big name goes, the bigger the name you get, the more television ratings you get. So the network always wants as big a name of an actor and a part as you can get. Of course, it still has to be right for the part. And uh, speaking about Gregory Peck, one of my favorite films that I did was uh, The Scarlet and the Black. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's a true story about a Monsignor who saved uh, prisoners of war in Rome and, and got them out of uh, Italy. And um, the commandant there was uh, Christopher Plummer. He was the head of the Nazi party. Uh, another wonderful person to work with, Chris. Uh, anyways, uh, I read this script, and it was fabulous. It was the greatest script, and I begged to do this show. And I, was, I had a, a lot of friends at CBS, and so I got to them, and I said, I will do anything to do this project. So he said, well, uh, Peck uh, approves everybody. You've got to be approved. And I said, OK. So they set up an appointment. And I went into Homey Hills. And uh, I get to this beautiful house. And uh, the butler lets me in. And I'm in the living room. And I'm looking around. And I, the bay window goes on to a lawn that looked like an acre. It was gorgeous. And as I'm looking out, I hear a voice behind me say, hello, Jerry. And I turn around, and there he was. And we chatted for about an hour, and he was so delightful. And uh, 
So when I finished, I said, well, I had a good interview. I hope it happens. And what had happened was uh, after I met, uh, uh, Greg met me, he, he called uh, Richard Chamberlain, who I had just worked with on Shogun, and he said, is he good or not? And I got a, a good, good uh, report, and I did this film. And uh, another story I want to tell you about this film was uh, I was shooting in the Coliseum for the preface at night, and only two people were Gregory Peck and Christopher Plummer. And they were talking about how Christopher Plummer wanted Gregory Peck to get his wife out of Rome to save her. And the conflict was, why should I help a Nazi? You know, that kind of thing. It was wonderful. It was like a 10-page scene with these two giants. And I'm sitting there at night, and the, moon, and the moon's up there, and they lit, and here's the Colosseum. And I, and I looked at it, and I, I got out of myself, and I said, my God, this is... Who could, who could think of a thing like this at night in the Colosseum with two great actors? Anyway, we did the scene, and I shot, I think, I don't know, 10 or 11 different setups. And every setup that I did, the two actors were perfect. And I printed take one on every, every one. I never had to do it twice. They were that good. Gary, I've got a question from a, from a writer's perspective. When I first started writing, I never gave two thoughts, whatever I put down on the page, that the actor had to sit and commit all of this dialogue to memory and then step out and in character keep all of it in here and then just spew it out as many takes as you Have you worked with actors who do that better than others and what do they do to keep all that running around in there in, in character? You know, I don't know, but that's a real talent. That's a real talent. Um, most of the time, the actors are pretty, pretty great. On a scene that, you know, like in a, in a courtroom, for instance, and you have tons and tons of dialogue, sometimes we'll have cue cards. But um, a, a big-time actor would be insulted to use cue cards. But, but I will tell you a cue card story. <laughs> yes. I have a cue card story. Um, who was I working with, Marilyn? Glenn Ford. Uh, a nice man, but he... Yeah, after, after lunch, it was, you know, forget it. <laughs> anyway, he, uh, I got along with him. I was working on this thing for three months. It was a six-hour miniseries. And I had one scene where he was laying in a hospital bed doing his lines, and I had to put the cue cards on the ceiling. And he was sitting there. Right? And then, and then uh, you know, he had it underneath the sheet and everything. And I, but I got the words out. It was just... That's what I had to do. So I was so happy to finish that show because it was torture. But I, you know, I had to stay calm and do it. got it all done. About two weeks later, I'm at home, and the phone rings. And the uh, producer calls me up, and he said, hey, you just worked with Glenn Ford. How was he? Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, you can't say he's a drinker. You got, and I, I'm trying to... I said, well, what kind of a... What kind of film are you doing? He says, it's a Western. I said, do you have a horse that can carry cue cards? <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and, and, and he said, really? I said, yeah, uh, but, you know. He said, well, oh, okay, well, thanks for the information. <laughs> I figured, okay. Anyway, the next night, phone rings again. Hello? Hello, Jerry. This is Glenn Ford. I knew it was coming. Why did you tell this producer I, I needed cue cards? <laughs> that, was, that was the way you talk. I said, well, Glenn, you know, we had them. I, I had them. I never looked at them. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to get you for this, you son of a bitch. And then he hung up on me. <laughs> you can't tell the truth. You can't do it. Yeah. Any other Wait, questions? I have one more, one more cue card story that's wonderful. I worked with an actress by, actor by the name of um, Anthony Franciosa. Good actor. But he couldn't remember anything. <laughs> and um, this was a 10-hour miniseries called Wheels about the automobile industry. And Rock Hudson was the star of it. A marvelous man, by the way. Never had any instinct about him. Uh, he was perfect. Really a nice person. Anyway, we're doing the scene in a car. And it's in, we put in the rain, and the rain was coming on the, on the windshield. And 
we, I'm doing the scene, they're, they're talking, talking, and Francie also says to me, uh, cut, cut, cut. He says, what's the matter? He says, I can't read the cue cards through the windshield. There's too much water there. <laughs> and, and, and Rock, during the over, over shoulder, you know, the camera's this way, he would hold the cue cards for him right here. Rock would do it, and he'd be talking, he'd move the little cue cards like this. That's, that's the kind of guy he was. These crazy things. Like 6'6", six, six, crammed into this little tinky car. Yeah, we were it was wild stuff. Wild stuff. Anybody? Yes, in the back. Hang on. Wait till I get there. Oh, I have a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. You don't have to yell. Go ahead. Rhonda offered to poke him for some stories that weren't in the book. Can you do that? Uh, okay. Should we do the drug runners? In? No, no, no. Really. Um, let's start with that interesting event down south. Oh, you mean with, uh, what's his name? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I was in Atlanta, and uh, I was a pretty well-known actor. I won't mention his name, but... Um, oh, come on. Well, you know, okay. It was Corbin Burnson. You guys <laughs> and, remember him from yeah. L.A. Law? Yeah. And anyway, so we're, uh, I come in in the morning. We, this was a big miniseries. I come in first thing in the morning, and... Uh, um, Corbin comes in, and he, and you know, this is Georgia, right? In Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, yeah, right outside Important of it. Part of the story. And he and he says, uh, "I can't get my makeup." I said, "What? My makeup girl's not here. My makeup. What am I going to do?" I said, "What happened?" So I go and ask what happened. He says, "Well, she got drunk last night, and they arrested her." And he says, "I'm not shooting today. I'm not working. I, I won't do it without my makeup girl." And he's pouting, and he's, "You rats down south, you bigots!" And he, and he starts talking against these guys, and most of them were carrying. You know, oh. Don Staus, they, they, they carry, you know, especially the drivers, you know, they have... This is a and, room full of Teamsters that are all packing yeah. heat. So, and he's shooting his mouth off, you dumb son of a bitch yeah. Southerners locking yeah. up my oh. girl. How, I'm not working. Horrible. So I'm, and I'm producing and directing, and I, I got to get... And he won't get... He won't do it, right? And so I'm saying, oh, God, hell, what am I going to do? Anyway... Um, we finally got her out of jail, and she came and showed up at 11, and then we started working. And I was way behind, and I was working, working. And uh, the, the Teamsters started to think about what this guy was saying, you know. And I could tell there was a lot of unrest going on, <laughs> you know. So my, uh, my second assistant comes over to me, and he says, Hey, Jerry, I just heard that they're going to follow him home tonight. Now remember, they've got guns, and they don't like to hear this kind of talk, and they're going to follow him home. I said, well, whatever you do, don't tell Corbin. Don't mention it to him. I, I got to keep making this movie. <laughs> well, sure enough, some big mouth told him. And he had his personal assistant go into town and buy him a pistol. That's a kind of a dummy he was. So now he had a pistol. And uh, the end of the day comes, and he hops in his car with his driver, and he takes off. And the Teamsters all go into a van, and they follow him. And I'm like this, and I get in the car, and I'm following them. And we get to the house, and he, uh, Corbin didn't look back or anything. He went in, closed the door. The Teamsters pulled up, and they just stayed there. It, they just wanted to intimidate him. Nothing ever happened, but... Luckily, he didn't say anything anymore. But when I finished the show, uh, it was an NBC show, uh, three months later, uh, Corbin Burson goes on the Johnny Carson show, and he's talking about the miniseries. And Johnny says, well, how was it working down there? And Corbin started to tell him about all these rednecks down there. He told them right on there. I mean, he had no th thoughts. Well... When the show came out, nobody watched it. He killed the ratings. Zero in the South. Yeah. Nothing. Takes all kinds. Anybody else? In the back. Hang on a second. Here I come. <clears throat> I can just squeeze in here a second. Go ahead. Um, I haven't read your book, but uh, did you work with any actors who subsequently had political careers? And, uh, and uh, the second question is, uh, do you think they could tell the difference? <laughs> That's funny. We have a stand-up comic in the audience. Right. 
<laughs> no, but I know one actor who's going to be into politics. Mark my words, it's George Clooney. One great guy. He's my neighbor, and I'll tell you, he's a really a wonderful person. And I think uh, you may see him up in the White House someday. He's, he's, he's fantastic. Wow. We have a question here. Would we be surprised how many movie actors or TV actors actually do use uh, cue cards? Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Um, no, the big one. The big ones. I said before, the big ones don't. They, they don't. They don't. They're they're fine. But uh, it really depends on the situation. Uh, and a lot of the times, you know, their memory goes when they get older. It's true. Mine mine goes too. Uh, uh, it just depends on the situation. But I, you know, I have to analyze it. So when I when I do a courtroom scene, I got to be ready. So. Uh, if I say, you know, this speech in here is get this section ready. And then if an actor comes to me and says, I, you know, I need help, then we, we do it. We set it up for him. I think you uh, see it more commonly in sketch comedy because those shows, they don't, you know, have one scene that they've rehearsed the same way for month after month. If you notice, if you watch something like Saturday Night Live, you can see their eyes moving back and forth if you look closely while they're in the scene. Because they only have a week. And so oftentimes sketch comedy just moves quickly so they really are dependent on cue cards more. Jerry, I've got a question. You worked with an actress who, who I got to work with very briefly and one of my favorite people in, in the world, and that's Angie Dickinson. Oh, you yeah. Talk about Angie. Well, she is my favorite person. When you say easiest to work with, Jimmy Garner and Angie Dickinson are two of my favorites. They're personable, funny, friendly, great. They're really a great person, really is. Unless you really tick James Garner off. <laughs> yeah. Why? What happened? What did I do? When he got no, not you. When you were on the set shooting that night. And oh, Glenn, that one. Yeah, that's Glenn a good Larceny. Story. Yeah, see, she remembers more than I do. Um, Garner, we were at Universal Studios, and uh, you know he was doing Rockford Files. And there was a producer on the lot by the name of Glenn Larson who did a lot of shows like, uh, uh, what's the one with the motorcycle and stuff? The car that talked and all that. But anyway, anyway uh, he, uh, Glenn Larson did a pilot and he used the music out of Rockford Files without permission. He had a long reputation of <clears throat> borrowing some music. Right. They call Not it, the first time. They called him Glenn Larceny. <laughs> So anyway, uh, I'm up on the roof at night shooting at Universal with, with uh, Garner, and uh, he comes over to me and says, Jerry, sometime in the evening, I gotta leave for about 20 minutes, I just wanna tell you how to time. No, no problem, you know, I, I'd give Jim anything, he was the greatest. So we're filming, and then all of a sudden, uh, Jim disappeared. And here's what happened. He had told the guard at Universal, when Glenn Larson leaves the lot, call me, I wanna talk to him. And uh, so Glenn uh, was at the gate being detained, and James, James comes in and he said, roll your window, well, roll your window down. And he grabbed him, and he slugged him right in the face. And he said to Scotty, the guard, he said, did you see that? He said, no, I didn't see anything. He says, okay, watch this. <laughs> and, he hit, <laughs> and he hit him again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a great story. And then Jim came up here, and he was happy as a lark, you know. But uh, these things happen. It was great stuff. Jerry, did, did you ever work with uh, Jack Lord from Hawaii Five-0? I did. I did. There, was a, there was a story that he demanded that people on the set of Hawaii Five-0 refer to him as the Lord. Was that true? No, I, no, I never heard that. But I did, here's what he did, though. He always had, had a white suit on in, in his civilian life, and he'd walk down Kalakaua Boulevard, and like, I'm, I'm Jack Lord with his white suit, you know, showing off. But uh, I liked him when he did Stoney Burke. Any of you remember that show? Yes. That was a great show. Yes, we have a question. Hang on a second, right here. Hang on, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. We got this lady and I'll come right to you. Okay, thank you. Um, Sandra, or Rhonda, sorry. Um, you had to pick through a lot of stories. Like, uh, are we hearing, like, when we read the book, will it be 10% or like 1% or how many, is there gonna be a sequel? 
That's a good question. Um, what, I, what I chose to do, because otherwise they're stories, but I, I chose to do it by sitting across from Jerry and having him tell me the stories. And I would ask him questions, and I taped the whole thing. But I would watch, and so I could poke at those, those stories with questions. Well, what did that feel like, or what did that, and get a little deeper so that I could see the cues would come up that, wow, this really upset him or this was really something sensitive, or this really made him mad, because this guy is steady as a cucumber. You have to be when you're heading multi-million dollar sets across the world. Steady as a cucumber. So I really had to sort of dig to see where the emotional drifts were, if you will. So we taped the whole entire thing, and I went from story to story that, like I said earlier, sort of a character evolved out of it. So you're actually following somebody through their, their painful stuff and their joyful stuff and their surprise stuff and, and that point of view of it. I mean, this, the stuff he went through hasn't even gotten into Italy yet, but that was quite a drama. But like, what does that feel like when, you know, you've got, you realize you're sitting at dinner with a bunch of drug lords who could like take you out at any minute? Those sorts of things. But that was how we did it. And it, it was, um, it, I pretty much got most of it in there, actually, because I really wanted the meaty stuff that had some, to make you guys turn the next page, right? What happened? So. Right here. I got it. Do you ever work with Carol Burnett? No, I haven't, but she's, uh, I, I love her work. Or Corman, or no. none, none of those guys. They, they were doing their stuff, I, I never did. There's a question here, hang on one second, here I come. <laughs> Your good remembrances about making the movie, the miniseries Shogun, because that was one of the first miniseries ever out, and it was a fabulous program. Oh, thank you. Well, it was it was probably the toughest uh, television show ever done. I, I I refer to it as the Gone with the Wind of television. It had every kind of technical problem that there is to do it. Um, what had happened when the book came out? Uh, Marilyn, my wife, read it. She's an avid reader. I'm not. She says, this is a show they'll, they'll never do. It's too difficult, too difficult to do. And when I heard they were making a miniseries out of it, I said, she said it couldn't be done. I'm going to go and try and do it. So I went after it, and uh, I had to be approved by James Clavell, the writer. And uh, I was off to Japan to prep it. We did not have a script when I prepped the, the first time when I went to Japan. We, we prepped from the book. We used the book as a, as a guide of what we needed. So we would see certain actors, and I'd look at locations, and that was the start of it. And then eventually the script started to come in. And, uh, but it, the hard part of it was that uh, I had a, a crew of 130 Japanese and 25 Americans. And the Japanese really wanted all Japanese. So there was a conflict there. It was a cultural conflict. Um, my producer, who also wrote the script, was um, he was like my brother. We worked so close together. I couldn't have done it without him. Uh, and he handled all the problems with the Japanese, which allowed me just to use my uh, focus on making the film. And... Uh, but everything happened that you think can happen in a bad way. There's a big sequence in Shogun, if you remember, of an earthquake. And uh, we, uh, we knew that we would only have to be able to shoot at one time. So I had 10 cameras in various locations. And we found an area that had been rutted out by the rain. And they, they put boards on top of these uh, ruts with a, a board underneath it with a little like a firecracker, and when the prop man, uh, special effects guy, hit the thing and the thing went off, the boards would go down and all the dirt would come in, and that's the way we were going to do it. So we get everybody in position, we rehearse it. Of course, we can't rehearse the earthquake. We rehearse the position and talk about it and all the camera angles, and uh, spent the whole day getting it ready for this one shot. And then finally we're ready, and... Uh, so I said, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to, I wanted to be sure that every camera was working. So I say, camera one, rolling. And he say, rolling, camera two, and I, all the way up to 10. So by the time I, the 10 was rolling, uh, 
Camera one had already rolled 400 feet of nothing. But, but that's OK, as long as the cameras were working. So I said, OK, ready? Everything's ready? OK, action. And I give the special effects man the cue, and he hits the button, and nothing happened. <laughs> nothing. Cut. And I'm thinking, oh, OK, uh, you better find out what's going on. He said, I'll be right back. And he goes down, and he goes into the tunnel where he had all this stuff working. And he comes back uh, about 10 minutes later. He says, um, he said that the dirt, it rained after we set everything up, and the dirt got like mud, and it got real crusted, and it, it didn't open. I'm going to put bigger charges in there. I said, yeah, but the light's going. i got to get this shot. He says, give me 40 minutes. So the light in Japan at that time of the year went, out, went goodbye at 4 o'clock. So sure enough, 40 minutes go by, and he comes up. He says, I'm ready. OK, ready. Everybody in position? All right. Camera 10 rolling, camera 9, all the cameras rolling. All right, action. Hit it, Bob. Nothing happened. Now I'm, I know I'm in trouble. Cause, uh, so uh, the, the, all the crew and everybody went over, and they started to see what was going on. And uh, Bob went underneath again. And while he was underneath there, the crew, which was talking and jabbering, they stepped on the boards, and the whole thing collapsed on top of the, the effects guy. Now he was buried alive. So not only am I shooting a movie, I'm going to get thrown in jail for killing somebody. <laughs> so we start, uh, talk, they call the uh, uh, ambulances and the helicopter and the fire department and everything, and, and they're yelling at him, are you okay? He says, yeah, it's all on top of my back, and I've got a space to breathe. He says, but you've got to get this off of me, because he had a little pocket. Anyway, they dig him out. They take him to the hospital. We wrap. There was nothing done. We go back to the studio, and we sit down with the Japanese and say, okay, we got to reshoot this, but we'll do it a different way. We'll work out of something that works in a different way. All right, now tomorrow, here's what we're going to film. And the Japanese says, no, 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 we don't, we're not filming anymore. I said, well, well, why not? He says, there's an ill omen on the set. <laughs> Somebody found a dead snake, and that was the ill omen on the set. So now, I didn't get my day's work. The guy's in the hospital, and the Japanese won't shoot. So I'm sitting there, and we're, OK, well, wait a minute. we got to work this out. You know, you're here. We, we're making this movie. You can't. you got to do this. And so finally, somebody said to him, how do you get the omen off the set? And they said, well, we have to have a Shinto priest come in and bless the site. He said, you got it. <laughs> the next day, we're out there, and the guy's with the things and the costume, and he's blessing the set. We went back to work. <laughs> cultural. Cultural Another stuff. cultural thing that I find interesting, particularly in what our, our country is going through right now with women and their, their place in the workplace. And you've got a really good story that sounds like it's from the 1800s, but it really wasn't that long ago about women in the workplace on the set with uh, your, in, your interpreter. Oh, that's a good one, yeah. Uh, in doing Shogun, every all the Americans had interpreters because most of the Japanese didn't speak any English, so we all worked through interpreters. My interpreter was a Japanese girl. Her name was Wei. She was very good. And um, um, all of a sudden, um, what happened? I can't remember that story. You, you would gather everyone together or tell her what the... Oh, right. OK, I got it yeah. now. Yeah. So um, I would get the In whole the crew in front of him, and I tell Way, I say, okay, here's what we're going to do. The camera's going to be over here, and uh, the actors are going to go over here and uh, take that wall out of the set. And I'd give her all these instructions. Now, she would go and talk to the Japanese, and they'd, they'd ask questions back and forth, back and forth. So they'd come back to me, and she'd say, they want to know, did you mean you want to move this and this and this and back, back, and back, back and forth, back and forth? Well, by the time I got my first shot, I had wasted 15, 20 minutes on an explanation. And I knew uh, it's impossible to f film this way. You Every know? single shot, all yeah. day long. Talk, 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 talk. Anyway, this went on for a week. And at the end of a, a week, I was two days behind. And I get the call from Paramount. And they said, uh, you know, you're shooting for 135 days. If you're two days behind on the first week, at the end, you're going to be 20 days behind. This isn't going to work. I said, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. I had no idea what I was going to do. I'll, I'll, I'll solve it. 
So uh, I think about this thing. I said, well, okay, I understand. I'm losing all the time in talking. So I, I, said, uh, I said to Wei, um, I'm just going to talk to them directly. And she says, well, they won't understand. I said, I don't care. I'll, I'll talk loud. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm, I, I say to them, all right, we're moving this. The actors go here and everything. And they go to her once and said, did he say this? And she'd say, yes. So I knocked out three steps, basically. And at the end of the second week, I was back on schedule. Yeah, and I'm saying, I knew I could figure it out. Sure. So I'm sitting at lunch, and uh, Wei is next to me. And I said, well, the studio's happy. I'm back on schedule. It's a good thing that I talked to them directly. And she said, well, that had nothing to do with it. I said, why? She said, oh, they didn't want to take orders from a woman. And, of course, nobody would ever say anything. That's what it was. So they understood the whole time, but yeah. the fact that it went through a female made it... Yeah. Can't hear it? Any other questions? Yes, over there. Hang on here. I, oh, right here. Hang on. Go ahead. Can you talk a little bit about your education, your inspiration, your apprenticeship that led you on this path when you were so very young? Well, I tell you, uh, when kids come up to me and say, how do, you, how do you get in the business? How do you become a director? How do you do this? Besides having a little talent and knowing the technical aspects of it, you've got to be lucky and you've got to know somebody. Those are the two things. You've got to be lucky and know somebody. Um, um, when I worked on, um, on Lucy, uh, one of the sponsors was um, Campbell Cigarettes or one of them, and the um, executives who would come on the set all the time. Uh, I got to know one of them, very ni uh, really a nice guy, and then we got friendly, and then he's, he asked me to do a couple of commercials for him, and I did, and that was fine. And I went about my business, and one day he called me and he said, uh, um, I'm doing this pilot, and I want you to come and edit it. And I said, well, I'm, I'm working at Fox now. I was cutting the Daniel Boone show. And he said, uh, no, no, no. He says, I got, I, I've got some things for you to do besides just being an editor. You're, you're going to be real happy. I want you with me. And I thought about it, and I like this guy a lot. And I said, okay, I'll come over. And it was the pilot of Hogan's Heroes. <laughs> and I was on that show for six years. And on the third year, he said to me, you know, you should be a director. I had no idea uh, that I could even do it. I was happy. He made me an associate producer. So I was supervising the editing. I was a associate producer. And he said, you know, you, you should really direct. And I said, um, I, don't, I don't know. And I just thought about it. And I said, you know, I, if I, I knew the technical aspect. I knew camera. I knew editing. But I didn't know how to deal with actors. So I did, without talking to him or anything, I, I went to UCLA and I took drama at night. And I um, went to Santa Monica College and took psychology because I figured the best way to deal with actors is psychology. By the way, that was the smartest thing I ever did. <laughs> that, was, that was the key to it. And uh, after the, a year went by and I had it, I went to him and I said, OK, uh, Eddie, I think I, I, can, I can do it. And he let me direct the last episode of the fourth season. And it all worked. But I, I wouldn't do it till I was ready. But I had the advantage of somebody giving me a chance, you know. But, Jerry, your early years, because you grew up in a home where your dad was a banker. There right. was, you know, that... Well, my, my uncles were so, in the studio. Yeah, tell my me uncles about were that in, part. My uncles were in the studio. One of my, my uncles was uh, the manager of RKO Pathé Studios, and uh, the other one was the producer of the Loretta Young Show. And so I was around it. And when I, I used to go on the lots and watch them make films. I was always fascinated by it. And I, I always wanted to be an art director because I paint and I uh, uh, have a good sense of design and stuff. But and you had a little camera you were dragging. Yeah, around. I took pictures and stuff. So when I got out of high school, and uh, uh, Rhonda mentioned, I did have a scholarship to Yale. But, you know, I really wanted to get in the movie business. And I figured, uh, I'm not going to wait four years to get in. Uh, so I went to my uncle and I said, look, I want to get in. Can you get me a, in an art director? He said, let me try. So he knew everybody, but he couldn't get me in because the unions were so tough that unless you're a son or a daughter of an art director, you couldn't get in. So he, he said, um, 
can't do it. He says, what about editing? And at that point, I didn't know what even editing was. And he took me to the editing room and he showed me and I learned how to be an apprentice. And that led me into getting into Desi Lu because uh, my uncle knew the people over there. That's who you know. It really helped. Here, here. We have a question here. Hang on a second. I got it. Hang on. Go ahead. Um, as a follow-up, that uh, with the women's issue, and especially now, it's really. I'd really like to know how you feel. That was kind of a cultural example of how they wouldn't take directions from a woman. But in your view, looking back, how were women viewed at through your tenure, and did they have any power? Did any of them have any power? Uh, the talented ones did. Yeah, uh, I dealt with a lot of women writers, some women producers, and most of them were terrific. Uh, it, it really depends on the person, you know. Um, I think this thing with the uh, sexual abuse thing is a little out of hand right now. It's like a witch hunt. I know Harvey Weinstein's a really bad guy, not only with the women, but everybody hated him because he was mean to people. He used to yell and scream, and he was a real bad person. But uh, it's, it's a little out of hand right now, you know. You know, you can't even hug anybody anymore. It's crazy. Got a question here? Hang on, I got it. I got it. As a follow-up, the political divide today is just incredible. James Wood recently said that he is no longer able to get parts because he's a conservative. When you were in the business, I don't think it was like that. Today, if you're a liberal, you're in. If you're a conservative, you're out. Is that correct? No. I don't believe it. I know Jimmy Woods, I work with him, and he's a wild man, and a lot of people don't want to work with him. So he, he, him saying that is an excuse. He's a very talented actor. James Woods. Hang on, we got a question here. Hi, um, question. You worked with a lot of very, very wonderful old actors. You mentioned Gregory Peck and all these wonderful people. Do you find it an appreciable difference between the talent then and the talent today? Um, all I can tell you is the writing in the old days was better. And I think that had a lot to do with it because if you have a great script, a mediocre actor can become great. You know, an actor is either good or he's not good. I don't, I don't think it makes any difference on age at all, you know. Uh, Peck, uh, at that time, he was probably in his 70s. He, he had no problem with lines or everything, anything. It was great. It, it, but the material is what makes it. That's the key. You well, there's own. so much more of it now. Yeah. There's a, the a problem, 500 the problem is every, Everything has changed now. You know, when you go to the movies these days, it, yeah, it's hard to find anything, for me, to find a story movie. Everything is science fiction and big effects and everything. It's, they're all the same. You can put the same title on all of them, and they're boring. But if you see a story movie, that's interesting. But that's the writing. And, you know, like in the old days when Billy Wilder, I don't know if you know who he is. <laughs> yeah. He's a great, you know, yeah. he wrote the greatest stuff in the world. He was a great writer. And all his films were wonderful. It really depends on the writer. I give, when I get a, a script, I'm only as good as the script and, and the writing. That's what it's, the key is. I have a question here. Did you ever work with Mel Brooks or Gene Wilder? Never worked with either one. They're funny. Yeah. That's an understatement. This one, Frank. Right here. Hang on. Go ahead. While you were looking through Gene Wilder Bridget's bedroom window. Uh, <laughs> you want to know that one? Uh, why, well, did, why did he look through Gina Lola Bridget's bedroom window? Well, I'll tell you that one. I was, I was casting a, an Italian woman on a mini-series I did about Michelangelo, and we needed a sexy Italian woman, and somebody suggested her. So I said, okay, can I meet her? She said, no, you, she, she didn't want to come to you. You come to her house. So we went down the Appian Way, went to the house, and she greeted us, and it was very charming, and we had tea or whatever. And she said, oh, uh, I'd like to show you my bedroom. I said, well, you know, it's fine. And I walked in there, and it was all in red velvet drapes, and there was a mirror on the ceiling. <laughs> but she was charming, really was. <laughs> but she passed. <laughs> yeah, recently, recently. We have, we have a question here. 
I got it. Jerry, in the past, you told me some stories about, particularly about the shooting in Japan, a story with something crawling across the ceiling. That was a very funny story. Do you remember? Which, what, tell me again what it was. You, you were in bed. You saw some, some animal. Oh, oh some, yeah, 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 that, yeah. That's a great story. And you also told me a story. I don't know if you can tell it here about working with Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> that, that's hysterical. But don't, uh, don't go there if you can. Well, <laughs> no, Whoopi is a great person. She just has a foul mouth. She's got a real foul mouth, but she's great. But I was, when I went to Japan, um, the... We shot in Tokyo for three months and in Kyoto for three months, and then we shot in this desolate area, if you, where, if you remember Shogun, uh, where the village was made. It was very primitive, and they had to build all the sets and everything. They actually had to build a road to get to it. There was no road. Yeah. That's how primitive it was. Right. Then they, they had to knock down trees to get the equipment in and then replant trees on the way out when they were finished. That's how primitive. But there was, um, there was one hotel there, but it was 45 minutes from the location. And we were, we were on a night shoot, which meant to, I went to work at four in the afternoon and came back at six in the morning. Everything was at night. And, but I said, gee, I, I don't want to travel 45 minutes uh, back and forth. There's got to be another hotel. So they said, well, we found one that is, is, uh, nobody's there anymore, but we're going to refurbish it. And we can take about 40 of the crew and put them there. And I said, that's for me. That's where I want to stay. I save all this time of traveling back and forth. So the first night when I got there, um, there was only about seven of us or something, and, and I went into the room, and uh, I'm sleeping, and all of a sudden I, I had to go to the bathroom, and I get up, and I turn on the light, and I look up, and there was this giant crab crawling across the ceiling. It was about this big. And I said, holy cow. So I take my shoe, and I hit it, and it falls on the floor, and then I grab a towel, and I beat the hell out of it, see? And I said, oh, God. So now I go back to sleep again. And I wake up a couple hours later, and I turn on the light, and now they're crawling on the floor. So I said, I, I got up, got dressed, went to the lobby, slept there the rest of the night, and I said, I'm not staying here anymore. This is it. I had to travel back and forth. The biggest problem was that the driver who took me back and forth at, at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning, he wanted to sleep on this road. So he'd be driving, and it was a curvy road, and, and he'd be going, nah, 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 and I could see him, and I had to stay awake, and I was, I was so tired. And I turned the radio on, I did everything, and, uh, but I lived. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the hour. And you can see we're here wow. from, I know it went quickly, too quickly, but there are books at the back, and I think uh, you're going to sign books, would you not? To. Absolutely. Sure. So if you would, uh, let me just suggest all of you uh, buy a book. Jerry London. Thank you. Rhonda Collier. Thanks.